survey and I work in the Equal Opportunities Unit in Queen's and um, yes we have been on a long journey and we are going to share that with you of our involvements in Athena Swan and our achievements to date. What has worked for us and what we see in the future, how to integrate SWAN with the Gender Equality Charter Mark for the Arts, Humanities and Social Sciences and uh, tackling unconscious bias. You can see all the happy faces in this photograph. This is taken um, round about 2009 and at that stage we had seven of our schools were over at the Royal College uh, of Surgeons for a presentation for Athena Swan. We actually, our journey towards gender equality goes back before Athena Swan. It started with a number of senior women in Queen's who were unhappy at the speed of change and they got together and they held a series of listening exercises and all the women across the university were invited to those. They really, it was from that, the agenda for the way forward was set up and part of that there were uh, short term, medium term and long term actions were identified and our Queen Gender Initiative was created as a result of the listening exercises. The Queen's Gender Initiative um, is separate to the Equal Opportunities Unit. It has a director, and Teresa is our current acting director, and that person is allocated 20% of their time to the uh, Queen's Gender Initiative. There's an administrator and a clerical member of staff. Our involvement with Athena was pre-Athena Swan as we all know it today and for that work Queen's got an award in 2003. So it ha it's a journey that has been going on for quite some time. As was said, we currently hold a Silver Institutional Award which we will be renewing this autumn. And Queen's has 20 schools 11 STEM and 9 Arts, Humanities and Social Sciences and all of our 11 schools hold an award. Two goals, Biological Sciences and Psychology and Teresa was the champion for Psychology and put the application together. So no better person to be here. And we have one school with a bronze award and they have submitted for a silver award. So fingers are crossed there. Has it made a difference? Well, yes it has. We have seen changes. For us, Athena Swan is a good framework um, to track progress, to enthuse people by the achievement. People like awards and it is great also for uh, developing very healthy competition between schools and it has meant that the challenge of promoting women in academia has filtered down into the schools. So, in the year 2000, 11% of the professoriate positions were held by women. Today, it's 22%. In 2006, one of the 20 schools had a female head of school. Uh, and I reckon if I were to give you a list of our STEM schools, you'd probably be very quick to pick out which school it was. School of Nursing and Midwifery. Um, now, we have six female heads of school. On the academic related side, we are almost at 50% female. And that's having gone from 26% in the year 2000. The, we have eight directorates and four of those are held up by females. It has made a difference to the number of women on Senate. Currently 40% of 
our Senate seats are held by women, and again that's from 26% the year 2000. And we have a very successful mentoring scheme for women, and to date 51% of those who have been involved <coughs> in mentoring have been promoted, and we're currently updating that to see more recent successes. Some of the actions that, and um, this is just sharing some of them, that have been uh, part of our journey and that were identified as part of the listening exercise. And that was to look at the culture within Queen's. And part of that was the visual culture. In our great hall, it's a magnificent hall. In the year 2000, it was adorned with portraits of distinguished men. Not one woman in sight. That has changed. And these are just three of the examples of that. And the portraits have been commissioned. The one on the left, um, some of you might well recognise, is Mary McAleese, who was held presidency of Ireland for two terms. She is a graduate from Queen's and was always also a pro vice chancellor at Queen's. In the middle, uh, oops, back again. In the middle, <coughs> we have. Professor Molly McGeown, who was the first female who was elected to the Royal Society of Uro Urological um, Surgeons, a very distinguished woman. And over on the right, we have Baroness May Blood, who was on our Senate for 10 years, from 1999 until 2009, having worked in uh, a linen mill when she left school and then became an active trade unionist and moved on to work in integrated education. And she actually donated her portrait for the Great Hall. Mm -hmm. Other examples of changes that have come about we have our very successful Queen's Gender Initiative mentoring scheme where women are paired up for a year uh, and matched along whatever the area they want to develop in. We also have a virtual drop-in mentoring service and that's really for people who just want advice on one area and they will be matched for that but they don't want a year long. We have mandatory equality and diversity training at Queen's. We developed an online program called Diversity Now and all staff complete that course. They have to have achieved a certain level in it for it to be considered completed and that includes our Vice Chancellor. We also have, for anyone who's going to sit on a recruitment and selection panel, they must have completed, successfully completed equality and diversity training and have attended recruitment selection training which includes an element of equality. We run training events which are specifically targeted at female PhDs and PDRS to suit their needs. We have an annual promotion seminar for women this is very well attended and it encourages women to apply for a promotion and also it's an opportunity to let them see the statistics to date on the success which women have had and uh, lots of myths are being on at that event. We have senior women's dinners and uh, on International Women's Day, senior women bring along usually a colleague who is at an earlier stage in their career and it's an opportunity to network. We hold workshops on various topics. Our most recent one was how to increase the uptake of STEM subjects amongst girls in the post-primary sector and that was very well attended by science teachers, and some career teachers, head teachers and some people from industry in the STEM subjects and we want to develop that contact. In most of our STEM schools 
for those members of staff who are research active and are returning from maternity, adoption, or could be currently or long-term sickness, and um, they have a six-month teaching free period to enable them to get back up to speed with their research. Queen's and this predates any <coughs> statutory obligation provides three weeks paternity leave on full pay and we find that that has always been um, taken up by partners of people having a baby or adopting a baby and one a very good example of somebody using it creatively one man took the three weeks in 30 half days because it meant he could look after the baby in the morning and his wife could have some sleep. We have the Central Maternity Support Fund which um, can be availed of to provide cover for a person going on maternity leave so that they feel free and they're not worrying about what's going on while they're away. Important message to remember is all of these actions need resources and that includes for some of them financial resources there isn't you have to have resources to implement actions so to hand over to professor Teresa mccormick who is going to take you through the impact which our actions have had today okay thanks jim Okay, so I'm going to say a little bit about the impact that our actions have had, a tiny little bit about the processes that we have in place, and then if I have some time, talk about um, future actions. Okay, so um, we have at Queen's and all of our STEM departments a core working hours policy, and actually this is something that they asked for in the applications that you put in for an individual school application. And they ask you what your core working hours are, and these are hours in which um, all scheduled meetings, not necessarily teaching, but scheduled meetings like staff meetings and, and so on, are expected to take place. Now, um, all of our STEM schools have a policy on this. Frequently it might be between half nine and four o'clock, for example. And we find that it really does assist both men and women. Um, then these men want to be able to drop their kids off at school as well and then um, get in for a meeting at half nine. Um, we have, as a result um, of the STEM, or the SWAN initiative, introduced workload models in some of our schools. Now, some of your schools may already have transparent workload models. If they don't, then in actual fact, this is a really good opportunity to get schools to put this kind of thing in place. And we put one in place in psychology as a direct result of the Athena SWAN initiative. And it's really made transformed um, whether there are differentials um, in terms of people's workloads. Um, I think a very important issue with regard to um, a famous one is the way that it makes you think carefully about your appraisals and promotions procedures. So for example, within psychology, in order to make appraisals consistent, all appraisers now get together beforehand, before the appraisal arrive, and they discuss what they're going to do in the appraisal to try and make sure that everybody has a similar, consistent type of experience in their appraisal. We also make sure that people bring up issues to do with promotion every time. Um, there is a appraisal process. There also, um, I think it's led to an increase in transparency around promotions as well. So one thing that Athena Swan is very keen on is that you don't just sit there and wait for staff to come forward, put themselves forward for promotion, because we know that women are less likely to do that. So what Athena Swan wants to see is evidence that you are proactively looking for who's ready to go for a promotion, identifying those people and supporting them in so various actions that we put in place around promotion have been about proactively identifying people and supporting them um, in order to get promoted. Um, a very big and important issue um, is uh, concerns part-time working. Now, how do you deal with staff who are, are part-time workers, both male and female? Uh, so, for example, in my school, we had someone go forward for promotion last <coughs> year, and she had had two periods of maternity leave, and she staggered her return back over several years. And so she came back to work here one day a week, two days a week, three days a week, until she was gradually up to full time again. Then she applies for promotion. But what do we expect from that person? Do we expect them to show a profile that's similar to somebody who hasn't had those sorts of career breaks or hasn't been working part time? No, there's an explicit recognition that 
we, um, the targets that we might set for somebody who's been working part time are not the same as the targets you might set for somebody who's been working full time. So there's greater recognition of that. And of course, we find that with the policies that we put in place about letting people have teaching free periods on return to work, um, that uh, transitions around maternity leave and care leave are easier. And we know from our statistics that some of these do, things do seem to work because women are at least as successful as men in applying for promotion, and in some years are more successful than men, suggesting perhaps that women have been perhaps delaying and holding back from applying for promotion, so that when they do apply, they definitely are ready. Uh, we have also found, um, particularly for, for postdoctoral researchers actually, a number of our uh, Phoenix One schools have set up the postdoctoral fora because they realise that postdocs often are the forgotten bunch, the forgotten layer um, uh, in between staff and students. And often um, they need some kind of targeted support and they need um, support from each other as well. So we've got um, postdoctoral fora that have been set up as a direct result of the Phoenix One initiative. Just to say a couple of other things about impact. Uh, I think, speaking from my own personal perspective, from my own school, but I think this is also true across the university, is that um, there has been a kind of culture shift around childcare responsibilities, not just with regard to women, but also with regard to men as well. So for example, in my school, if, you, um, if you've got childcare responsibilities that mean that it would suit you much better to start a lecture, to be able to start your lectures at 10 in the morning or half nine in the morning, and we will try to accommodate that. It's not necessarily always possible, but if we can, we will. Um, and that's true for men as, as, as well for women. Um, uh, we've had one staff member, for example, Emil, who uh, had, had a young child and his, his partner then was on well for quite a long period, and the school was very flexible about letting him work from home and even bring his child in on occasion. Um, so we really recognise now uh, that, um, that but it's okay to have kids, it's okay to have childcare responsibilities, and it doesn't mean that you won't do your job. But there are things that the institution can do in order to help and support you in, that cir in those circumstances. And not just childcare responsibilities, other types of care responsibilities as well. So I think generally, um, uh, I mean, if you one is not paying me to say any of this, um, I'm not in their pockets by, by any means, but I think that the whole initiative has, has maybe put a greater emphasis on creating a kind of people-friendly atmosphere um, amongst the faith. For example, when you put in an Athena's born application, they want to know what is it like to be an academic in your department? What is day-to-day -day life for you like as an academic? And they want to hear that you're working in a people-friendly institution where there might be social spaces, where people can mix, where there's social events, um, where people feel valued, and so on. And I think that the, the whole process um, has, has potentially helped in terms of making the, the institution have more of that sort of atmosphere. Um, one thing that we'd like to be able to say is that engaging with the Venus One process potentially helps you attract staff. Um, is that true? Have we any evidence for that? I've only got anecdotal evidence, I'm afraid which is that I, um, two weeks ago I was running a focus group for um, women who, who were, and we were talking about the barriers um, uh, with regard to promotion, and one of the women there had come from Bournemouth, and she said that she was agonising over whether to give up her job in Bournemouth and move to Northern Ireland, she knew nothing about Northern Ireland, and didn't know a soul there, and then she saw that we had the Venus One Silver Award, and she said, well, they can't be that bad, you know, there must be something good about that institution if they've got that a Venus One Award. So, um, we have actually managed to poach a member of your staff <laughs> uh, as a result of the fact that we've got our Athena Award. Although I, I, I have to point out that you have managed to poach a member of our staff. Thanks, Jim. Thanks, Jim. Is it Laura? <laughs> is it the Laura? Is it Laura? Laura. 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 Laura.
some of the work we were doing already are actually, but it has brought that into focus and I think strengthened it. As I said, we are not paying the expense. So why engage with the Athena Spawn process? Well, hopefully it results in a better working environment for males as well as females. And I, this is what Athena Spawn themselves say, and I think actually there's some truth to this. Uh, well, um, in terms of carrots, rather than sticks that might try and get you to engage with the Athena Swan process, we know that funded institutions now are starting to take a lot of interest in this, and we know that RCUK have announced that they expect institutions that they fund to engage with these sorts of processes, and that's true of other funded institutions as well. We know that in the last round of breath, when we had to write our environment statement, one of the things we were supposed to mention in there was what we were doing in that individual school um, uh, with regard to quality and diversity. And if you're able to say in that environment statement, oh, you know, we've got this award, but this award, then that's just shorthand for lots of other things. And I can't imagine that that's going to go away. I think in the next year's submission, it's quite likely that if anything, it will become more of a focus. Um, okay, so. Um, that's the kind of style with regard to Athena Swan, but I, I wanted to say a couple of more practical things. Um, the first thing I want to say is really that, you know, it sounds as if we've got this kind of wonderful nirvana in green, that we've all got it all sorted out. Of course we haven't. It's a very slow process, and there's lots of work left to be done. So what this graph shows you here um, are all the different categories of senior people in our institution. I don't know what the equivalent names are in government. Um, but these blue bars are females and the red bars are male. And what you can see really across all of these different senior positions, only about a third of them are still taken up by women. And that's primarily because we don't have the same number of female professors as we do as males. So we still have a lot of work to do um, before we've got something that looks like um, a, a proper balance, particularly in terms of seniority. Okay, so I will talk more about the kind of nuts and bolts and the practicalities of what we find has worked for us. Um, some do's and don'ts. Okay, so this is a message to the Vice Chancellor now, right? Sure. <laughs> <laughs> um, our experience is, uh, this is, I, I can't stress this enough really. Um, uh, you know, a famous one isn't different to lots of other things that the university might do. It's the Vice Chancellor that sets the tone really. If everybody thinks that the Vice Chancellor has got buy-in with regard to a particular initiative or a particular policy or principle and so on, um, then it's amazing how many other people will quickly discover that it's set priority as well. So we find that it's very, very important that um, the tone is really set by the Vice Chancellor and then that filters down. So we've really found that getting buy-in from our deans um, to be extremely important right through to heads of departments. So I think this one operates in kind of two directions within an institution. In this top-down way, where the senior um, people kind of set the tone and put the structures in place, and then in a bottom-up way, in which individuals in the school start to get together in their own teams and try to think about um, what would work and what needs to be done for that individual school. Now, <coughs> once you do start getting swan teams together in departments, we still find this. You'll find reluctance skepticism and people saying, why bother, it's a huge amount of work, what's the point of it all? And I think that that's something that you just have to be aware of will, will happen. You know, it still happens in between that all the years we've been engaged in this process. Um, I think, critically, you do have to have some very good structures and processes in place. This will not happen organically. Um, it does have to require a lot of organisation. And I'll just sketch out very quickly how we organise things in Queen's. So we've got a set um, of our STEM schools, in fact we've got 11 here, and in each of those STEM schools there are, schools, there are, there are two different um, SWAN champions, and we call them champions, and those are people who head up that initiative within that school. Those people then feed up into what we call our SWAN champions group, so they meet um, from all the different schools at about every six weeks, and um, uh, they report back and forth between those groups. And then we have a further group, oh, sorry, I skipped ahead here. Apologies. Um, <laughs> right, so we have a further group here, uh, which is the SWAN steering group, and that's full of quite senior people. So it's got our director of HR, it's got our engineering um, physical sciences faculty dean, the director of QGI, which is me, and, and lots of other people as well, who are quite senior and heads of school too. And really, um, those people then, their job is to feed up to the vice chancellor in university management. 
the people here are sufficiently senior that they do have the ear of the Vice Chancellor in University Management. And I, as QGI Director, report directly to the Vice Chancellor. And of course, so does the Director of HR and the faculty. Overall, the sidelines, but really not, not sidelines in the sense of being marginalised, but in the sense of being on the side cheering people on and providing support. We have our Equal Opportunities Unit, Jane is one of those people, and then we have our dedicated Queen's Gender Initiative, and they have a lot of input at all of these different stages, okay, and they feed into all of these groups. Right, so a few other do's, do's and don'ts. Um, well, make sure your SWAN team has more than a token man on it. Uh, it really, that really is important, and they might come back to you and say there's just not enough men in this team. They want men on there because they want buy-in from the whole institution and the whole of the department. They don't want some women just jumping around on the sidelines trying to get notes and trying to get things done. They want complete buy-in. Uh, this is very important. Make sure your sworn champions or whoever's leading up within your skills and institutions be valued and rewarded. Academics have got a lot of pressures on their time huge numbers of pressures on the time. And if they get involved with this initiative, they're doing so voluntarily, and they really need to feel that um, they're being valued and rewarded for doing so. If somebody manages to get an award for the school, well, that's the time for the institution to put on some kind of high-profile celebration. And um, then that, that really will make a difference to people and feel that the work that they're doing is worthwhile. If you have a workload model within individual schools, then SWAN activity should be counted into that workload model. And this has been very important for us here. Try to have some continuity in one team over the award period. Once you've got the award, you have to put your action plan into place, and people will come and go. People will go off on maternity leave or find jobs somewhere else and so on. Um, and uh, you've got to make sure that you have some type of continuity in it. Okay, so uh, a couple of other days, and I'll just move on to a few jumps. Be aware that progress might be an initial So You're at the very start of this process. Your statistics are not going to change overnight. They're not even going to change in three years. Okay, so you get your bronze award now. You might want to upgrade it to silver in a few years. Don't be expecting overnight, you know, to have 10% more professors and uh, female professors than you had previously. Um, progress is, is slow. Um, it does build momentum, and we find that once individual schools start engaging in this one process, as Jane alluded to, schools start to get competitive with each other. I don't know whether that's a healthy thing or not. But it certainly happens in Queens. Um, so people are saying, well, they've got a gold, maybe we should go for a gold as well, and so on. Um, so it actually builds its own momentum very rapidly. Uh, get people to sit on judging panels. Both Jane and I have sat on numerous judging panels. That is by far and away the quickest way to find out how to write a good application. Just go and sit on a judging panel. Uh, and then you'll see what happens and um, what, uh, what, what, tends to be, what tends to be received well and what tends not to be received. Uh, we're very big into this and ensuring the best practices <coughs> writing in this stuff. There's no point in any individual SAT team within a school reinventing the wheel. If things work for another department, it's very important that that's shared um, amongst other schools. And our Champions Network really makes sure that that is the case and we also produce booklets that highlight um, best best practice. And I suppose the last do really is this one, which is that Everything, 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 when you put the application in, depends on how the application is written. Um, clarity of data presentation is extremely important. I sat on a panel where we've got an application in. The graphs came in, they obviously spent a huge amount of time in it. They were three graphs um, presenting particular types of ratios. And honestly, not a soul on that panel could understand the graphs. The application just went straight back. And we just said, I'm sorry, but you just don't have to redo this because nobody can actually understand the, the data that you put in front of us. The style and style of the start of the application, stick to it and make sure it's really clear. Um, remember, people judging these are going to be reading a lot of applications. They want to just cast their eye over something and see a clear message. They don't want to have to work hard to try and figure out what your data actually looks like. So that's really important in terms of the data presentation. They also want to see evidence that you're enthusiastic. Um, that you're not just going through the motions here, but that you're, you know, there's some kind of genuine commitment to what the, um, what the initiative is trying to do. And they want to see evidence that you've actually just reflected on what you need to do. So for example, if you are a school that has 50% um, female undergraduates, there's no point in you saying that you're going to have actions to 
who are targeting Christians who are female uh, undergraduates. She doesn't need to. What you need to find out is for your school where the leaky pipeline is, is if there is one. Okay, so it may be at any stage at all. The profile for your individual school might differ, and your actions need to be targeted around the difficulties that are specific to your school, and that involves a bit of reflection. Work hard on the action plan. Action plans actually are typically the weakest point of applications, and the bit of an application that's most likely to be sent back. So for our bold application, they sent their action plan back again. They said this action plan is not good enough, it's not smart enough, that means specific, measurable, if there, if there a person here tonight, you know, Achievable. 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 Whatever, whatever it is. Yeah, so it wasn't <coughs> smart enough, so we haven't, and they, 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 they'll say that, can you smarten up your action plan, please? So we had to rewrite the complete action plan and send it back. And we wouldn't have been successful unless we completely um, rewritten it. So a huge amount of, um, of, of emphasis is put on the action plan. But don't hold yourself in positive cost of fortune. You will have to carry out that action plan, so don't put things in there that you can't do or that are not realistic. So they do want to be realistic. A few don'ts, um, and then I'll, I'll just say a little bit about the future. Um, under, don't underestimate the sheer amount of time and effort. In the time that I have written uh, um, these sorts of applications and also worked on other people's applications in the, in the university, I probably could have written huge numbers of papers or grant applications or whatever. Each individual application that you put in is several months' work. It really is a lot of time and effort. And I'm not trying to put off people who are involved in the schools in thinking about doing this. Um, you know, go ahead, even though it is an ethical process. It is worthwhile doing. Um, but bear in mind that you can't do it in a couple of weeks. It's not possible. Um, and I think this is an important message for the university rather than for the academic staff here. Like, don't expect the academic staff to be able to do this on their own. Um, sometimes academics just they might need a bit of support to preparing graphs. We, we've certainly found that um, in our experience over the years. In preparing, presenting data clearly, sometimes that they need somebody to actually show them that the way they presented the data might look clear to them, but it's not clear to anybody else. Or they might some need some assistance in writing the kind of compelling narrative um, that they're looking for um, that really tells a clear story and shows evidence of enthusiasm. Um, just a, a, a quick warning here. I've seen a um, call who's the director of our HR um, our units, or sorry, our equal opportunities unit office, that they've created a monster when they created the famous one. They have created a monster. And um, there's a very small number of them working trying to deal with hundreds of applications. Uh, and if you contact the famous one, you'll, all, you'll get a bounce back and they'll just say, we'll try to reply to your email within a week. And they may or may not reply to it within that time. So you just can't expect that with replies from the hugely overworked. Uh, and this is an important message here. Don't assume that the work's all done. You've just put an application into bronze now. That is not your work done. Okay? That is really just the start of the process. And unfortunately, you then have to follow through and actually carry out your actions at the end of it. And we have found <coughs> that, even in psychology, I find this, that once you get the word, it's very easy to kind of sit back and think, right, I've done that now. You haven't done it. You've just made a promise that you will do things. Okay, and as, as I said previously, don't assume that you'll see rapid change, changes in your statistics. It might be um, at a snail's pace. And also don't be disheartened by feedback, or by failure. Uh, I was mentioning to James earlier on that when our school of medicine first applied for a silver female award, they didn't get it. And that, I think, was the most galvanizing thing uh, with regard to gender equality in medicine. Because suddenly the dean of medicine um, took it back that this is failure and he wasn't used to failing and he wasn't going to fail next time around and he set up his own gender equality office within medicine with its own separate administrative staff member and its own separate director who works 20% of the time on that and they got that silver award next time around um, so failure can actually act to galvanize things and to, to, to get things moving um, as I've said already, once you get involved in this awards process, it does gather its own momentum. But I think that it's important not to get too up and up in awards. We all like getting awards. It's nice standing there and getting our prize and getting our photos taken and so on. But really, it's not about the awards. It's really just supposed to be a means 
10 men. But I think that that's important, very important to remember that. It's nice to get the awards, but at the end of the day, what we're trying to do is create a better workplace. Okay, um, I'll just say a couple of things about things that we want to develop in the future, and then I'll go. Um, looking to the future, so just to say uh, <coughs> something about the gender equality mark. Now, the gender equality mark, you may or may not have heard about it. It's the kind of AHSS equivalent of SWAN. It has to be fully launched yet. It will be launched in, um, I think, October, November of this year, but a number of pilot exercises have taken place with regard to it already. Um, SWAN and JET are not identical, but the processes are really quite similar, and we're just starting to engage with them now within Queen's. A couple of differences. Well, um, within GEM, the Gender Equality Mark for Arts, um, Humanities and Social Sciences School, it's compulsory that you carry out a survey looking at the culture within your school. Look at what it's like to be an academic on a day-to-day -day basis within your school. You have to do that. They also ask for REF data uh, under GEM. That really is the proportions of um, females returned in REF compared to male. And they have their own existing electronic template that generates all those lovely graphs for you, so you don't have to do it. Maybe they thought the option of not using social clients, people may need a little bit of help with that, I don't know. But um, Athena Swan themselves now are developing a similar electronic template that should be rolled out within the next year. Okay, so we developed one ourselves within Queen's and um, they've got hold of that template and they're using it along with the gym want to try and come up with the template themselves. Um, just and then, then a kind of logistical issue comes up for us. What do we do with our GEM champions and the SWAN champions? Well, currently, um, they all meet together. We make sure we've got an arts, humanities, and social science at head of school in our SWAN steering group, and we've introduced this bodying system for SWAN and GEM champions. So I gathered from talking to James that you're not planning to engage with that process yet, the gender equality mark. Um, but to be honest, if you're rolling um, SWAN out within your skills, it might be a good thing to think about doing simultaneously so that all of the skills um, might start buying into the same set of processes and structures at the same time. But I recognise that involves additional work and um, you have to do a hearts and minds exercise with the arts and humanities and social science skills as well to get them on board. Right. Um, uh, I just want to say, I'll, I'll just spend two minutes on the next bit. Um, I'm not going to show you all the slides I was going to show you because I think we do need a bit of time for discussion. So, with regard to things for the future that we're, that we're looking at at Queen's, one thing where, where a lot of discussion around at the moment is this issue of unconscious bias. Um, and it's a very trendy issue within sort of the, the area of equality and diversity, as James would probably confirm. Uh, partly because there's been a lot of, been a lot of research recently that seems to have established the existence of unconscious bias. So this is really a target for future action. I'll describe just one influential study that you've probably heard of already that seems to suggest that unconscious bias really is a real thing and really does have an impact. Um, so uh, <coughs> this is at the appointment stage. So this is a study that came out in 2012. And what happened here was that a group of academics sent round a CV of a candidate to 127 professors. These were from across a number of different scientific disciplines. And they said, imagine you got this CV of this person. They, they want to apply for a lab manager job with you. <coughs> what I want you to do is rate them in terms of how confident they seem to be, whether you consider employing them, how much time you'd invest in mentoring them, and what salary you would pay them. And all they did was they varied the name of gender in the CV. So it's exactly the same CV going out to a bunch of science academics, male and female. And the data look a bit like this. Um, so what you see here is the male student is the dark bar, the grey student is the uh, grey bar of the female student. Um, these are the ratings of confidence, higher ability, and how likely to be to mentor that person. In every case, um, there were significant differences in the scores given to each of these candidates uh, with regard to confidence, higher ability, and mentoring, despite the fact it was the same CV, okay, but just different in gender. Um, they were asked how much you would pay that person if you took them on in a lab manager role, and here's what you find. They'd pay the male student over $30,000, the female student um, between about twenty-six and a half. Okay, and these are people with identical CVs. So um, this is kind of evidence to suggest that maybe there really is something going on here, that's something like um, gender bias. I'll skip back to this next one. I'll, do, yeah, I'll just finish on, on, on this, last, um, this last piece of evidence here. So this is a study here um, 
uh, that's only just come out actually, and what they, these two microbiologists did was they looked to see what happens um, if males versus females organize in vitamins and gosia within a conference. So <clears throat> they looked to see what, how, how many um, symposia will be organized that are all male versus all female if your organizer is a male or a female. And here's what they found. Um, the dark bars here, these are two different microbiology conferences. The dark bars here are if there were all male conveners um, uh, or if there was a female convener organizing within an invited symposium session. What you can see is the male conveners are much more likely to convene all male sessions than um, a, a, a convening group that has uh, females on it. So essentially, if you get a male to organize an invited um, symposium at a, at a conference, which is something that's considered to be quite prestigious to be invited to be part of one of these, um, then males are likely to invite just other males. Okay? If you have a female on, the, on board, they're much more likely to include the females as well. Now, the, notice this scale doesn't go up to 100 here, it only goes up to, it only goes up to 50%. But nevertheless, here you can see in 2013 at this conference, um, if there was an all male convenience, set of conveners, 50% of the time they only invited other men. Now, sim similar data um, exist around citation counts, um, success rates for grants, and so on. But um, I I'm aware that uh, you didn't invite me here to talk about unconscious bias, so I'm going to finish up on that. But it's something to be aware of. Um, so, so there's some evidence that either bias or particular types of behavioral patterns underlie gender differences in key metrics, metrics that we think are important. Um, and I suppose the take home message is a less controversial area here. Uh, but I think it's something that if you're serious about um, addressing gender imbalance within your institution, you have to take it seriously. Because it might be, to a large extent, um, about changing attitude and uh, improving people's awareness of the existence of these sorts of patterns and behaviour. And this is something that for us, I think it's going to be a very important future area as we go forward.